Who's the last guy to use this, right? Because the last guy is always in fault. How are we doing this morning? Well, this is kind of exciting to see a number of guys get up to actually come and study some theology on a Saturday morning when you could be doing sleeping in your room or whatever projects you're working on. Uh, so if you've got uh, your notes there, I, I want to take some time to go through those notes, and then you're going to have to let me know whether those notes are helpful or not. Um, if you want uh, my PowerPoint, you're more than welcome to have that. I, I won't print it out for you because it would take too much color on the copy machine and, uh, you know, a billion dollars, but if you want to take it home and do something with it, uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. This thing keeps turning down, and I have no idea why. Maybe I should switch it to the other side. The blessings and curse of electronics. So the first few minutes, I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, a little bit of his philosophical understanding, so that you kind of are aware of kind of where he's coming from. But this is, this is his systematic theology. It's pretty simple. It's a one-volume systematic theology. It's not that complicated. And uh, he's written it in such a way that I think it's accessible to the average dude, and uh, I consider myself the average dude, so it's helpful to me uh, to be able to look at that. Um, sometimes when you look at other systematic theologies, they're so lost in the language. I'm just like, what is he talking about? You ever felt like that? You read somebody and just like, oh my gosh, he's using words that I've never, then you got to go look them up, and, and that requires extra work, and anyway. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father in heaven, thank you again for the privilege of coming. And just as we look uh, today at an understanding of this uh, incredible world, Father, that is so different from how we think, but in one sense is like we think, help us to understand, help us to grow in this, help us to be able to really apply this to our lives, Lord. It does no good to just encourage head knowledge, but Father, I really want from this heart action as well. So let's... Uh, Let's study well, Father. We'll do this to your glory. Amen. Okay, so let me just, let me just give you a little bit of things of what we're trying to do, uh, okay? And then I'll actually get into the notes, and I'll tell you when I hit that. But I want you to understand uh, that there are distinctives of systematic theology and how it should be taught. Uh, one of the plain teachings of the, we, wanna, we want clear basis of what we believe about God's Word. We're formulating ideas and thoughts and trying to understand just exactly what the text is saying. And uh, I am going to be fighting with this thing all day. It just doesn't want to stay. Yeah. If someone could get me a piece of uh, not, uh, well, if they had tape, some kind of a rough tape. Or let's see, is Dan Kramer here? Hey, Dan, is there any way you can uh, get the other one from the ministry center? Just, just the lead. I've got the pack back here, but uh, if you do that, that'd be real helpful. Thank you, Dan. So we want to do that. We want clarity and explanation of biblical doctrine. That's extremely important, and you might say, well, I'm never going to be in a position where I have to try to explain to somebody certain things. Well, yes, you do. Anytime you make a statement like Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, you just made a theological statement. And, and you, you're going to need to be able to share that with people and back that up. Anytime you ever say God forgives you of your sins, not only the sins that you committed uh, yesterday, but the sins you'll commit today and the sins you'll commit tomorrow, you just made a theological statement. So understand what we say. And then, of, of course, we want it to what? We want it to apply to our life. It isn't going to do any good to have just a bunch of head knowledge and not really understand what the text is really saying and what it really means. And then we're going to focus on the evangelical world, simply meaning this, that our, that our goal is, is to try to take all of Christendom and bring it together because our goal is doctrinal unity. You know, Paul says in the book of Ephesians, till we all come to the unity of the faith. And a lot of people have asked the question, well, what does that mean? How do we come to the unity of faith? 
And my prayer and my hope is, is that through teaching and understanding, we might be able to bring about some unity. And there's going to be a difference between um, Roman Catholics and between Protestants. And people always ask me the questions, do you think Roman Catholics are saved? Well, I, I answer the question with, do you think Protestants are saved? Because it isn't a matter of what denomination you belong to. What it's a matter of is whether you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Jesus Christ that I'm talking about is the crucified one who's not the brother of, half-brother of Satan, but he is a literal... Oh, great, thanks. I'm going to unplug here. Turn it off, though. Oh. Is it on now? Good. Thank you. And, and we are, are, we, are we recording this or doing something with it? It's okay. It's going out. So, all right. If you want to get that, you can look at that. So, and I try to tell people, encourage them when we, when we study and we look at God's word together, and this is where our theology comes in. We define our terms. See, I hear a lot of preaching or teaching without any defining of any terms at all. Somebody will talk about holiness, and what it means in one group is one thing, and what it means over here is something completely different. Somebody will talk about the kingdom of God, and you kind of go, oh, wow, that's really good, the kingdom of God. And yet, somebody else is preaching the kingdom of God, and nobody's really clear about what the kingdom of God is. So when, you, when, you, when you're forced to put it into words, and the total understanding and comprehension of Scripture, to get a full idea of it, then you're going to be able to communicate much better. Somebody was talking about the sovereignty of God with me, and um, they were simply saying this. Actually, it wasn't with me. It was somebody else. They were talking to them, and, and then this guy called me about the sovereignty of God, asking me questions. And this guy's particular view of the sovereignty of God was God is absolutely sovereign. But, and there's that big but, right? There are some things he's just not sovereign over. I looked at him and I said, well, wait a minute, you can't say sovereignty and then modify sovereignty over here to fit whatever it is. You just made a big theological statement and you made a big buffoon of yourself because you just you don't understand what you're saying. And he was trying to explain and try to understand how his grandmother who has cancer is dying. And, you know, he was making statements like God didn't do that and God didn't allow that. And that's the work of Satan and on and on and on it goes. And there are certain elements of the statement that's true, right? But there's also elements of it which he's just proclaiming is absolutely false. So this is the illustration that uh, I use that when the people try to talk about the sovereignty of God, because let me tell you something, your head and your brain will explode when you try to comprehend God is the author of everything that has come about, and He is in absolute control but in such a way where he is neither the cause of evil, nor does he violate certain aspects of the creature's will. And in addition to that, he, uh, he uses everything to come about for his glory. So I look at the most wicked thing that happened on the face of the earth, which is what? The death of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is the most wickedest evil that ever came about. It is absolutely unbelievable to think that the, the, the forces of hell marshaled together to put Jesus on the cross. And yet when you read Acts chapter 2, when you read Acts chapter 4, the text clearly says that it was predetermined by the plan of God. So that is the worst evil that happened. But it was also part of the predetermined plan of God. How do you reconcile that? It's hard to do. But that really helps me 
when I'm going through something that's extremely difficult, a few years ago, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. She still has it, but it's a treatable form, and, and she's doing fantastic. But when you start looking at the fact that your beloved may die or you may die, and you say God is sovereign, and you go through something like that, it really rattles your cage. And so I had to sit back and say, okay, God, if you've ordained this from all things eternity past and you bringing this about, how in the world, Father, is this part of your, your love, your care for me, your watch over us? Why would you do this? Don't you know how valuable I am to you, <laughs> right? But the truth is, is that if he can ordain and allow to take place the death of his own son, who has never done anything wrong, and have the whole world turn against him, and even his disciples flee out of fear, he can allow hard things to happen to people in order to accomplish his purposes. So when we talk about his sovereignty, we have to be able to put it in the context of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, because other than that, you will just try to go insane. You'll never be able to figure it out. But my goal in this is to get you, when you're in a discussion with somebody, to ask the question or to simply say, define your terms. Because when you're using that word to describe something, it may not have the same meaning that I'm putting to it, and it may not have the same meaning that the Bible is talking about. So define what you mean, right? Bible says go out in all the world and evangelize, right? Go make disciples. So I, I, I was talking to one guy, and he drives around Hollywood with a shofar, you know, those really curly horns that they used in the Old Testament. And he drives around in a shofar, and he pulls up into the driveway of famous people's homes or as far as he could get to their house, rolls down his window, and he blows the shofar at their house. And I'm like, okay, what? T tell me what's going on with that. And he basically said this, well, this is the horn of salvation. It says so in the Old Testament. And just like the Israelites blew the trumpet and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, I blow the horn on these famous people's homes so that they'll come to know Jesus. Does that even sound like a relevant plan or a philosophy of scripture at all? It's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo that's all thrown in together. And, and then that's how you end up with the, so he, then he told me he really started off not doing the famous homes. He really started off by going up to the Hollywood sign and blowing the trumpet at the Hollywood sign, <laughs> hoping that there would be the death of Hollywood. And then about two weeks later, there was a brush fire in the area. And he came back and he said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, God's answering my shofar horn. And I'm going, uh, I don't think so. So we got to work on some doctrinal unity and hopefully that's what we're going to build here. And I say that not to say that the guy's not a believer. I'm not saying he doesn't love the Lord. I'm not saying he doesn't have a heart for people. I'm just saying that what the Bible has prescriptively told us about how to evangelize, I'm pretty sure that's not the way. Most people come to know faith in Christ not by a big gathering and somebody preaches and they all walk forward at an invitation. Most people come to know Christ through another Christian sharing the gospel with them. Most people come to know Christ as a child when they're growing up in a Christian home and they hear the word of God and they commit their heart in children's ministry or Awana or some form like that. And then some do come to know the Lord as full-blown adults and my parents rededicated their life at a Billy Graham crusade, so I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that there is, there is really some ways that we need to be thinking about what Scripture says in order to accomplish its purposes. Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that we will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine, so that's what you want to be able to do, sound doctrine, sound teaching, but not only that, you're going to refute those who contradict. That's huge. So my goal in this is twofold. twofold. One, to be able to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to teach one another, but also when you get into it with somebody, and, and there's a right way to get into it and a wrong way to get into it. So make sure you figure out what the right way is and then proceed very carefully. 
All right, here are some things that he says in his book. Let me just read them for you. He says, I've written it for students and not only for students, but also for every Christian who has a hunger to know the central doctrines of the Bible in greater depth. That's all this is. Avoiding technical language. Now, there'll be some technical terms. Why do we use technical terms? Why do we use words that are uh, big words sometimes? We don't use it to confuse people. The big, big words can be helpful in explaining a doctrine without having to repeat the explanation of the doctrine over and over again. It's like a shortcut. Uh, if you, if you, how, how many of you served in the military? I mean, if you served in the military, you, you got a whole different language, don't you? Where they tell you to defile or they tell you to, uh, what, what's the other one? Enfile, you know. And they give commands as to what to do. And, and each of those words have extensive meanings that you have trained and study. And you know that meaning. So you know, you know when somebody yells incoming, uh, that doesn't mean open the door, we're having a party. That means hit the dirt. But, you know, that language is helpful for your life. And so we, for instance, try to do that here. Like example, Trinity. Do you find the word Trinity in the Bible? No, you do not. Now, do you find the concept in the biblical teaching of Trinity? Yes. So why do we do that? We do that so that I'm up here preaching and teaching and I say the word Trinity, you all know what I'm talking about. Instead of saying Trinity or instead of saying, uh, well, you've got the Father who is not the Son but is equal to the Father and the Son who are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent, and you've got the Son who is equal to the Father but is not the Father and is not the Spirit but is equal to the Spirit, second subordinate to the Trinity, and then you have... You know, it would take you forever to get by any concepts. So we use those words not to confuse people, but to help you. And that's where you need to really learn things. Like when you ask a Mormon, for instance, do you believe in the Trinity you, you, or you believe in Jesus? You're going to get answers to that where they're going to say yes, and you're going to go, oh, they're just like us. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean by Trinity? What do you mean by Jesus? Who do you mean? And then you begin to break it down and realize we ain't talking about the same person, are we? How about this? To present theology clearly, simply, and thoroughly. That's my goal. And this is not a substitute for the Bible, people. Please do not think that, you know, if I do systematic theology or I read a book, I, you know, I don't need to read my Bible. No, you do. So theology should be explicitly based on the teaching of Scripture. And we've attempted to show that where the Bible teaches and gives support, that's what we think the Bible is saying. And it's got to come from the Bible. It's got to be using scriptural words. Why? Because that's the very Word of God. And the Word of God has authority over our life. Be like the noble Bereans in Acts chapter 17 who examine the Scripture as evidence for themselves. And so at every lesson, and I think on the back of your page, of your notes, if you turn it over in the back... I think you have a scripture memory verse, right? Matthew chapter 28. Is that right? And memorize scripture. You're never too old to memorize scripture. You may not remember where you live or your wife's name, or you may not remember, right? But you can at least memorize some verses of scripture, right? That's what our goal is, to learn and to grow. And God intended this to be clear and not confusing, but it's going to require work. You got to put your mind to it. Nothing that is ever worthwhile comes easy. There's always a price and a task to play. But I guarantee you this, when you dive into it, you will reap the benefits of it immediately. It's one of those wonderful things. Now, I do not expect that every one of you are going to agree with me, but I'm going to allow questions and answers. And if you come to a different conclusion than me, it depends on what we come to a different conclusion on if we're going to fight or not. If you're telling me that Jesus is not the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, and that He's the half-brother of Satan, well, we're going to have an argument. But if you tell me you believe in a rapture that's going to take place prior to the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation or just before the end of the tribulation or after the tribulation, I'm not going to argue with you. It's a tertiary issue. It's not that much. of We're only talking about seven years. And yet churches fight. This is the kind of stuff they fight over and divide over. 
And I'm like, what are you guys doing? I'm teaching Revelation downstairs. And I, when I teach it, I just, I let guys, I explain both points of view. Look at the scriptures. I tell you what I think the scripture is teaching. I'll give you others who feel different about that. But you ultimately, on issues like that, you got to decide, right? But I want you to know something, that I come from a viewpoint that says, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture, that this is God's actual words to us. Okay, And you may want to look at the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy to try to figure out what we mean by that. Because immediately when you say this is God's word, it's holy, it's inspired, it's plenary, it's verbal, it's given to us, somebody has another translation. And they, th- then they ask, which is the better translation? So the answer is, it depends. How can that be? Well, when we talk about inspiration, we're talking about inspiration of God's truth as it was given in the original language. The original language in the Old Testament was Hebrew, some parts Aramaic in the book of Daniel when he switches from chapter 2, verse 4 into chapter 8, that's written in Aramaic. The rest of it's written in Hebrew. In, in the New Testament, it's Koine Greek. And so anytime you go from one language to another, you're not just conveying the literal word but you are conveying the thought of what is being said there. And that's why when you study or you have uh, different translations, you'll have like the NASB, which is what I grew up with, right? And then you have over here like the uh, NIV, right? And this is called dynamic equivalency. So if you have a word and you're trying to understand what it is, The NSAB is going to give you that word as literal as they possibly can. And when you read it in English, it's going to be a little bit difficult because sometimes the sentence isn't going to make sense. But their goal in translating was to make it as close to the original text as they possibly could. So, you know, here you have the manuscripts up here, and they're doing it as literal as they can, where perhaps the NIV is trying to make it more accessible and understanding to man, so they're going to give you the equivalent dynamic as best they can. And then you have different translations that fall in between here. By the way, this, has, this is not paraphrase. Paraphrasing even goes farther than this. So if you have the Phillips or you have um, uh, God's Word to Modern Man, uh, if you have the New Living Translation, All that is paraphrase. They're not going from this. They're working more from this and trying to make it even more accessible. But I think you really lose a lot in there. I mean, I don't preach at all from any kind of a paraphrase. So how you understand the original manuscripts, right, and then how you translate, you could have a word that fits here and a word that fits here and they may be different words, but they convey the same thought. Because that's all a, that's all a word is. It's a vehicle to a thought. When I say something, all, all you're trying to do is then picture in your mind what I'm talking about. When I say car, you automatically think of a car, right? When you say truck, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm just trying to create that thought. So I believe this, that these books right here in their manuscripts are absolutely inspired. Now, we don't have any original copies. We, we may have one, maybe uh, P46, which is a manuscript that dates back w- we, to the second century. So it could be an original of the Apostle uh, John, but it's just a fragment. And you can imagine why we just have fragments. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, right? I mean, you try to save a piece of paper or a newspaper or whatever you wrote on for 15 years, and you look at it, it's all yellow and washed out, right? And then manuscripts also have families, that is, regions where they came from. So if you go down into Egypt where it's nice and dry and, it's, and there's no humidity there and they wrote it on parchment or they wrote it on papyri or they wrote it on vellum, which is animal skin, it's going to last longer than somebody who just wrote it on a piece of paper. And then you have like Qumran, which is near the Dead Sea that's dry. So they collect manuscripts from different areas of the globe, all around the globe, and then they compare them. And you will find there are really no doctrinal differences in any of the manuscripts. Now, are they all identical? No. There are some that are misspellings. There are some where one number is given and another number is given that could be what we call a scribal error. 
right? But we also simply say this, when that takes place and that happens, we've discovered that like 99.9% of the manuscripts are in total agreement, and there's only a few that are what we call variant manuscripts that, that, de- that may not have the exact same word. But however you look at it, it doesn't affect what we believe about inspiration in God's Word. So, is this God's Word? Yes. Is it inspired? Yes. Right? God said this, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The psalmist also said, Thy word is like, what? A furnace, silver tried in a furnace, seven times over thou shalt keep them, O Lord. See, I memorized in the King James. Thou shalt preserve them for this generation forever. So we believe theologically in the Word of God. I want you to understand that. I also come from a Reformed theology background, and many of you may be wondering even what that means, but we had a, 500 years ago, we had a Reformation. We, the church just used to be one conglomerate called the Roman Catholic Church. Well, there was a split in 1000 A.D., And in 1000 AD, part of the church went up into Russia and became what is known today as the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Russian church. And then the church in the West went down south to Rome and it became the Roman Catholic Church. And as the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church began to skew away from Scripture, a group of men called Reformers who were about 1500s, 1600s, broke away, and a man by the name of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, broke away and began to teach justification by faith and disagreed with the Catholic Church and went head-to-head with the Catholic Church. And they disowned him and uh, wanted to put him to death at several times. But God greatly used that man to break the doors open of salvation. Why? Because he believed and he went back and he translated literally the Word of God, word for word in the German language, to understand how to get saved. Because when the church, the church wouldn't let you have a Bible. In fact, he went down into the basement of one church where he was residing at and studying, and he found a copy of the Bible. But it was chained, if you will, to the book stand. In other words, you couldn't take it out. And I don't remember the story if he stole it or, or he just sat there and copied it, but he, was, he wanted to know what God's Word said. And the Catholic Church does this. You do not have the ability to understand the Bible. So we're going to develop a teaching on the basis of the Bible, and then you get to look at our teaching. So when they would tell you that the Bible is inspired because it follows the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. So when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, the trouble is this, is that here's the Word of God as the standard, right? This is Standard just means rule. Or sometimes you hear the word canon, It means the standard. This is the standard, the Word of God. This is truth. But here's what they do. They put the church over the Word of God. So you don't start here. You start here. How many of you grew up Catholic? I I know so many people grew up Catholic, and I knew that was in the Bible. Nobody ever told me that. But I could tell you what a cardinal sin is, a venial sin, I could tell you what a peccadillo is, you know. They didn't learn God's Word. So we're going to understand what God's Word says. So that's Reformed theology. But if you can see this sign, can you see this back there, that the uh, Sola Scriptura? These are the five things that came out of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, these are all Latin terms. Latin just uh, was the language of theology in that day and study and law. It just means Scripture alone, Right? Then we also believe in faith alone. If you're going to be saved, you have to have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And it's not by your works, right? So when we say faith alone, we say faith alone, but a faith that is not alone. Because the nature of saving faith, James is going to tell us, what? Has works involved. Those works don't save you, but they validate the fact that I've come to know Christ. Sola grata, that is grace alone. We believe in that. We believe in sola Christus, Christ alone. There is no other Lord for salvation. 
and then sola de gloria, which simply means to God be the glory. So those are the five things that came out of the Reformation. They're all limited, or they're all given to us here. But we also have five distinctives of uh, theology. One is called total depravity. How many of you have ever heard that term? Some of you have. I don't necessarily like the word um, because what we're saying is man is depraved. And when you say total depravity, you tend to think that God is saying everybody's depraved. Well, we, what we mean by is this. Everybody's a sinner and man has a total inability to save himself. That's what total depravity means. Salvation, when we talk about the sovereignty of God versus human ability. Okay, I believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is actually sovereign over your salvation. In fact, when we look at the doctrine and understanding of salvation, I don't think God's up in heaven, you know, sitting up in heaven going, oh, man, I so wanted that guy to come to know me, but he just, he just wouldn't listen. Well, that may have been one aspect of God's will, His will of desire. But when you look at salvation from the decree of God, that nobody's in heaven who shouldn't be there, and everybody who should be there is there. Why? Because He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Well, how can that be? I don't know. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And if it says He did it before the foundation of the world, regardless of whether it fits in my mind or not, I'm going to believe what He says. Right? Right? Okay. Atonement. Limited. Is the atonement limited? Some, this really throws people off because, again, when I say to people, define your terms, and then they go on to a find limited atonement, and it's not what, it, what that it's talking about. The atonement, the death of Jesus Christ, the atonement is a word that we use. It's a biblical word, too. We mean this, is that God provided a universal provision for all people to be saved by. Jesus said, whoever comes unto me, Right? Whosoever believes shall be saved. Does that mean that everybody's saved? No, it's limited. It's universal in its provision for everybody, but it's limited in its application. Only some get saved. How about election, predestination? It's the one that always gets me is free will. When you talk about the doctrine of election, and I don't fully understand it, but I'll do my best to try to explain it, people say, well, what about the free will of man? What about it? Well, doesn't man have free will? No, he does not. Well, what do you mean man doesn't have free will? Because the Bible says man doesn't have a free will. The only people that ever had a free will was Adam and Eve. They were the only ones who were created, put in a garden, had done nothing good or bad or right or wrong, and yet they had a choice between whether they were going to obey God or disobey God. You say, well, don't I have a free will? Not in the total freedom. Why? Because you're born and you're dead in your trespasses, in your sins. So your will is already bent. It's already going to go the direction of sin. So when we talk about man is totally unable to save himself, we're talking about the fact that God has to come down. God has to, as Jesus said in John 3... What, what did he say to uh, Nicodemus? You must be born again or literally born from above. Meaning that God has to come down and quicken and regenerate your heart because you're dead in your trespasses and sin. You then respond by faith and grace and belief and trust. Now, we'll talk about that because I know that really can upset a lot of people. Um, but I think once you understand the fullness of it, you'll, you'll, you'll get a picture of it. Hopefully, that'll be clear. And then I also teach the security of the believer or eternal security. I don't think you can lose your salvation. Or as the Bible uses or the, the uh, theologians call it the perseverance of the saints because that's the word that's biblical, to persevere. Amen? Questions? Yeah. We have greater faith, and God gives us greater faith. Yeah. So you're talking about the word faith, and now you've got to put it into a context because faith, right, 
again, in Hebrews chapter uh, 11 says what? Evidence of things hoped for, right? So that kind of faith, but there's also saving faith, which is, I think, what you're getting at. Does God supply me the saving faith to believe? Is that the question? And then how does it play into my decision? Your maturity, okay. In, okay, so you, you grow in faith. So, so there's an aspect of you continually growing. And, and faith doesn't really grow like that. It kind of goes like this. You know, how many, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's how it goes. But when you look at where you started here, you look at where you go here. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So without this book being put into your life, you're not going to be able to go forward. You're going to atrophy and go the other way. And you hear a lot today, and the term that's real popular is deconstructing my faith. You ever heard that term? So-and-so, the prominent Christian is now deconstructing their faith. It's just another term for apostasy. They're walking away from Jesus. But Jesus said it would be that way, didn't he? I mean, read the parable of the seed and the sower, parable of the four soils. How many of those soils actually knew Jesus and were saved? Well, I think it's just the one, the last one, the one that believed it, the one that received it, the one that trusted in it, the one that walked by faith and produced fruits. So this is what you want to do. You want to grow, and you need to take the Word of God, and you need to apply it, and that's hopefully what this is going to do. That's my goal in all this, that you'll be able to grow and bring about maturity because remember what it says, go ye therefore into all the world, and what? Make disciples, mathetes. And then he tells us how we make disciples, teaching them to observe, right, everything that I've told you and taught you, baptizing them. So that's our goal, is to take it and move it forward. Any other questions? Yeah. You're predestined, that Calvin, yeah, and, and by the way, when you talk about Calvin and predestination, so the guy who wrote more on predestination than Calvin was Martin Luther, so you would think that a Lutheran church would be very much about predestination. Problem is, is that after Martin Luther, a man by the name of Philip Melanchthon came in and kind of redid his teaching, and so that's why the Lutheran church is where it is now. But Calvin also talked about predestination. And people say, well, is that where it started? No. I say it started a long time ago when God says, I've chosen you. When he, said, when he looked at Jacob and he looked at Esau, what did he say? Jacob have I loved? Esau I've hated. Now, love and hate in that context is not talking, oh, I just hate this guy. It's not that kind of hate. It's, I mean, I've chosen one over the other. Now, why does God do that? Why does he choose one and not choose another? His choice. He gives an illustration. Does not the potter have the right to say to the clay, I made you for a vessel of honor and I made you for a vessel of dishonor? See, people hate that. You know why? Because it rubs up against the autonomy of my will saying that God has a right to do with my life whatever he chooses. And man is shaking its fist at God saying, you don't have a right to do what I want. Well, you can shake your fist all you want, but you, he has the right to do it, and he's done it, and he will do it. He even says to Pharaoh, did I not raise you up for this purpose? I mean, think about that. That man was raised for the purpose of doing what he did to Israel in order that God might manifest his glory to his people. But some people don't like the doctrine. I love it because it gives me great assurance of salvation. I know that I'm His because I can't earn it. I can't. Now, must I believe? Yes. Must I, must I exercise faith? Yes. Must I exercise trust? Yes. But that faith, that trust, that all comes, I believe, from God. For by grace are you saved through faith and Yet, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Right? 
Well, we'll exegete that a little further. Any, what, there's another question somewhere. Spread your tongue. Yeah. And if you if you encounter them, here's the deal, my brother. They, they are trained to be very argumentative. And they, they are the most counterculture hostile of the cults that you will engage. So I mean, you know what I, you know what I do? They they if they knock on my door, they don't come to my door anymore because they know, you know, who's there. But I remember the first couple of times they came and you know I I did this intentionally. I went upstairs to grab my Greek New Testament and came down and I opened it up and I said, read that, you know, and they're like, well, I can't read that. And I go, well, you know, let me tell you what it says. And I explained it to them, you know, and they got all argumentative and they want to fight. And, and I'm not going to sit there and, you know, do the whole argument. So this is what I said. This is what I said to the guy. I turned to him because they always go out in a team of an older and a younger. Have you noticed that? I, I turned to the younger guy and I said this, I said, I don't know where you are, but you're obviously here being trained. And I I understand that you want to emulate this person. But let me just say this to you. Jesus said, it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and to be thrown in the depths of the sea than, uh, than to lead one of these little ones like you astray. And I just leave it at that. Now, did I change that kid's heart? I don't know, but I guarantee he's going to go home and think about that. He's going to remember of all the doors that I knocked on. Why? He got God's word. I gave him what scripture said. I gave him what Jesus said. A clear warning. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you're on, you're on our side, right, Fred? Okay. Right. Just checking, just making sure. Okay, yeah. Yes. Well, what, what do you mean by in the flesh? To find your terms. Yes. Romans. Yeah. Romans 10 tells us what. Oh, absolutely. You have to do what Paul says, the obedience of faith. See, when I say predestination, some of you thinking that what I'm saying is everything is predetermined in such a way that what you do does not matter. That's not what the Bible teaches. So what we believe in, and uh, I, did, I knew if I mentioned predestination, this was going to happen because it's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. So J.I. Packer, if you want to read a good book, it's a little thin paperback. It's called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. I, it might even be online free, but you can get that through Kindle or anything like that for a couple of bucks. He basically says this. Here's God's, here's God's sovereign will, right? Here is our will here. And somehow, in time and space, this intersects and we don't know where. And so we call these two irreconcilable truths, right? I have human responsibility. I'm responsible for my decisions. God is sovereign over everything in my life. We call this an antinomy. Antinomy is two parallel truths that are non-contradictory that eventually will reconcile on our understanding somewhere in, in time. Maybe when we get back to glory with the Father, He'll explain why and what. But I do know this, faith is not, it can be dead if it doesn't exercise works, good works. Jesus emphasized that. Paul emphasized that. James, when James is talking about justification by faith. He is talking about the nature of saving faith. What actually saves you? Jesus saves you. How do you know you got Jesus? You manifest good fruits. 
But of all those things, here's the ultimate. Peter 1.8, 1 Peter 1.8, it is this, do you love him? Because it's possible to exercise all kinds of spiritual things and not be saved. I mean, what's the scariest verse in the Bible to you? Matthew chapter 7. Many will come unto me that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not? And they go through a whole litany of things that they've done. And then the very scariest thing is, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Well, that's terrifying. When I first read that, I thought, oh, I better get my butt out of bed and do something for Jesus. But that verse is teaching that you can actually be very active in doing so many things, but do them for all the wrong reasons. And the ultimate reality is, is you're not doing the will of my Father, which is to believe upon Him. In other words, all that in Matthew chapter 7 is a warning for those who are not believers, yet who are trying to work their way to heaven. Example, Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons. Man, I'm so glad. It's such a relief to know that I don't have to work my way to heaven. And it's such a relief to know that my heart has been regenerated, quickened, made alive by the Spirit of God, and now it is my great joy and pleasure and my desire to do that for the glory of God. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. I got to keep going, Fred. Okay. I got to keep going here. Okay. So, I don't expect you to agree with me on everything, but we will talk about it. Okay? Say yes. You agree? Okay. All right. Now, the Bible also talks about gender role, and here's two words that we made up to help us understand. What's a woman allowed to do in the church, and what is she not allowed to do? I go to some churches today, they got women preachers, and you know. I go to other churches that won't even let a woman talk in a church. Well, that is, not a, that is an issue, but it is not a primary issue. No matter what you believe about that, there's a right, there's a wrong. God knows, and we'll do our best to explain that. But please understand this. It doesn't mean you're going to hell if you misunderstand, because it's not a primary doctrine. How about church government? Congregational versus elder rule. Presbyterian, which has a presbyteros, which has a, a, a senate or a session that meets, that oversees all the churches. There's a lot of freedom in that. How about believer's baptism? Infant baptism. How many baptized infant? I was baptized as an infant. Church of England, Anglican. I was born in England. First thing my mother did is took me down there and got me wet because I was going to go to heaven. Now, I've been immersed in believer's baptism, which is what I think it's teaching. But there's a difference between why they do this and why they do believer's baptism. We'll talk about that. Spiritual gifts, boy, that's not controversial at all, is it? No controversy there, you know. Do you believe in all the spiritual gifts, Mike? Yes, I do. I do. So that would make me a continuist. A cessationist basically says only certain gifts have survived past the apostolic years. I believe that the gifts are real. I believe that they can be practiced today. I don't all, by saying real, I don't mean that they're always practiced in the right way. Sometimes they're not practiced in the right ways. Again, Paul, 1 Corinthians 14 is going to give us the instructions on what to do and what not to do. How about church offices? Are there apostles today? Here you go, Dan. Is it a capital A, apostle, as in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, or is it a small a? Good book called The New Reformation Theology, called Nar Theology. There are those today who believe that uh, capital A exists, meaning it's equated to the 12 who walked with Jesus, and so they walk around saying, doing things that they believe is God given to them and their right to claim and speak authority over everything and anything. And I, that's not my understanding. Those guys, the apostles, they had that ability. We don't have that today, but again, you may walk away. 
with a different view. How about eschatology? Another big word. Do you believe in a post-tribulation? Meaning, see, those are technical terms, but Jesus will come after the tribulation and we'll have a millennial kingdom, a thousand-year millennial kingdom. When does Christ return? When is there a pre-tribulational rapture and a pre-millennial return of Christ? Millennium meaning a thousand years. So if we had to draw a chart of what eschatology, eschatology just comes from eschaton, which means last, and ology, which is the study thereof. And this is a horrible eraser, isn't it? Just smears. But when we talk about eschatology, we talk about, you know, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're living here in this church age right here. Until the return of Christ, Christ will come down and return. Now, here's the question. What's this called here, by the way? The second coming, all right? Now, after the second coming, is there a thousand-year period, which, Paul th- or which John talks about in Revelation, called the millennial kingdom? Two viewpoints. Some say yes, some say no. But... Also, there are others who say there is a seven-year tribulation that is going to take place, but prior to that, there's going to be a secret taking away of the saints on the face of the earth, and this is called the rapture. Rapture is not a word you'll find in the Bible, but it comes from the French, rapture, means to catch away or taken away. And the moment we start talking about eschatology, we're talking about Jesus coming here. And here. This is a secret catching away when nobody will just, everybody will be sitting there and one day the trumpet blows and we're out of here. And there's nothing but lost people on the face of the earth. Then we go through this seven year period of the tribulation. Then comes the second coming of Jesus. So do you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture? Do you believe in a mid, meaning in the mid of the tribulation? Do you believe a pre-wrath position, what happens right here just before the out, final outpour of God's Word? Or do you believe in a, what we call post-tribulational or only one second coming? So over here, the first coming of Jesus is His birth, and over here is the second coming. You know, are there any other secret comings or mid-comings or partial comings of Jesus? We'll talk about that. Oh, and that'll be a good day. <laughs> hang on, hang on just a minute. I want to go, go ahead. Yes, you said my already use a little book of Revelation because I have one. I have a partial preparation. I believe that the event, I believe that the event is the book of Revelation, um, except for the new heaven and the new earth, the first century, IAD. I believe the book of Revelation is a book of Revelation. Right, yeah. That, yeah, that's a preterist viewpoint that looks at Matthew chapter 24 and says that it's mostly historical. I would say some of it is historical and been fulfilled, but I also believe that there is yet some to be fulfilled. But we'll talk about that because there's the futurist view that looks just at the future. There's the preterist view which looks at everything in the past, saying it all happened and was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus came in and laid bare the city of A.D., not A.B. <laughs> I can put common air. I can do that. <laughs> After birth, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, Trent. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, quick, I got to hustle. What do you uh, think of the theology of purgatory? Purgatory, yeah, you're there. You're going there. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in the room, just you. <laughs> No, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about purgatory, but yeah, that's one of those things that the Catholic Church, remember what I talked about, how they don't teach the Bible? <laughs> Trent, last and quick. I gather your Calvin is not Armenian. Yes, I, 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 if you want to put me in a classification, I'm Reformed, I'm a Calvinist, but I'm a warm-hearted evangelical Calvinist that believes you ought to go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
See, yeah, our, our, Arminian is after Joseph Arminius. Armenians are the guys that have the good food, but Arminius is that other brand of theology that says it all depends upon you. But I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I, I, I hold to, see, when I go to Ethiopia and I, I preach the gospel, I beg people to come to know Jesus. Because if you don't believe, place your faith and trust in him, you're not going to get saved. Problem is, is God didn't give me a book about who's saved and who isn't saved. So my job, he didn't tell me to go try to figure that out. He told me to go preach the gospel, Mike. Build relationships. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Love your friends. Share Christ with me. But here's the beautiful thing. I can preach for 100 years, and if no one comes to Jesus, when I stand before him, he's going to say, come into my kingdom, son of God, because you were faithful to me to the very end. I mean, we're going to be living in a day and a time when we preach the gospel. There's not a lot of people who get saved. And it ain't too far away where we're going to be preaching the gospel. And they're going to come and they're going to pss, us out of here, put us in jail and in prison. I say, that happens. It happens. We haven't failed. God's word hasn't failed. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let me just let me get this real quick. Application to life, theology is ultimately an application that grows and worships, pleases, and glorifies God. Amen to that. I do not believe God intended the study of theology to be dry and boring. Theology is the study of God and His work. It is meant to be lived and prayed and sung. True theology is teaching which accords with godliness and a theology when studied rightly, will lead to growth in our Christian life. If you're looking at your papers, I haven't even started on that yet. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Our goal is to teach it in an evangelical world. I'm not a liberal in theology at all. In fact, the only ever place that God says to be liberal is to be generous in your giving. Uh, I have a high view of Scripture. I'm also like... Dr. Grudem, a conservative evangelical. I believe the Bible is inerrant, authoritative, clear, and sufficient. Um, my, my goal and my hope is for the progress and the unity of the church. That's really, I not only want to educate, but I, I, I want to um, see the church be one again. Don't you? Wouldn't that be a powerful thing? You know, we're going to have an Easter service in the park this year. And uh, we invite other churches to participate with us, and we do that because we're striving for the unity of the church. We want to see people united in Christ. And I, and I think that biblical doctrine does that. I think it helps that. And, and I don't care if, if you have a different view of, a, of, a, of women in the church or you have a different view of, of the charismatic gifts if you can articulate your position clear and I can articulate my position clear, I'm not going to divide over that or fight over you with that because that's a secondary third issue. Now, we're going to rightly divide the word of truth when it comes to the deity of Jesus Christ. We better get that right. But on those other areas, I'm not worried about that. But the problem is, is we start making all those other areas the primary issue and we end up fighting within amidst, amidst ourselves. It's terrible. It's terrible. So... I have to admit, in my younger days, I was, I was more divisive than I was unifying. And uh, through relationships and time, God has taught me that I really need to work on unity. Ephesians chapter 4, read this. Until we all obtain maturity or the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, the measure and statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Amen. He might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now we can begin your notes, but our time is up. So this is where we'll pick up next time. I'm I'm jealous of your time, and uh, I want to get you in and get you out as soon as we can. So when we get into this, we'll really start moving. Amen? Amen. Okay. Am I I boring you guys? Uh, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Unity on all the variant issues is probably impossible, but unity around Christ and salvation in the majors, I think, is possible. I mean, that's what Jesus said, right? I pray that they all be one, right? That's the downfall of Protestantism, is that everybody thinks they've got the right to just isolate and insulate from everybody else and do what they do. But don't think for a moment that the Catholic Church is unified. You go to the Catholic Church down in South America and the Philippines, it's a very different experience than it is here in America. In fact, many Catholics feel that American Catholicism is, is absolutely the weakest form of Christianity. But in, Catholic, but, in, but in the Philippines, man, I mean, are they hardcore Catholics down there? I mean, hardcore. They hold to that teaching. They put the fear of the Pope inside of them. And man, they, they, they talk about the treasury of merit, which is nothing more than how you get out of purgatory. They're hardcore about it. You know, they actually crucify people down in the Philippines. They have stainless steel nails and guys volunteer and they actually pierce their hands and hang them on a cross vicariously. I mean, how messed up is that? But they do it. You just go online. They do it every year. But that's for parades. That's for what? Parades. Yes, it is for parades. The worst traffic jam I ever got into was in the Philippines. I was just trying to cross the street and go to the hospital and all of a sudden there was like thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in the street. I go, what is going on? I was there, Danny and Philip over in the hospital, actually was crazy, and I was trying to go see her, and as I was crossing, trying to get across the street with my wife, there was this huge, huge, massive prayer. What, are, what is this? And then here comes this statue lifted up on a, on a podium, and it's called the Black Jesus. Um, not that Jesus is skin-colored black, but the Black Jesus, because this church had caught in fire, and everything burned except the Jesus, but the Jesus did get black. He, he was charred. And so they worship that. They venerate that. He comes through, and man, they are worshiping him. And as he's walking through the streets, people are throwing personal objects of cloth, T-shirts, underwear, whatever. They throw them up to the guy who's riding on the top. He rubs it on the Jesus and throws it back to you, which means you're going to be protected from, from whatever bad's going to happen to you. Huh? That's not an idol. No, no. Yeah, now we're going to start doing that on Sunday, by the way. Uh, money. money, yeah. yeah. Throw money up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you want to close this up then, Kirk? Or? Okay. Want to see pictures of my grandkids? Again? Again. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this day. Guy that's here, pray that uh, not only within this room, but wherever this message goes, because it's being streamed, Lord, that you that you would mature us in our thinking, that we would be seeking you, and we would really be seeking the unity of our understanding of, of who you are and how deeply. Take that knowledge, apply it to our hearts, and go out into the world and fulfill what you've called us to do, and that is to make disciples of all nations. We pray these things in Christ's name.